Okay, thanks for uh, clicking play there. Uh, I'm Mike Hartman, and we're joined today for a conversation uh, with Kristen Goss, a professor of uh, public policy and political science at Duke. Uh, her work focuses on policy reform movements, uh, social groups, and uh, something we're interested here, uh, uh, something in which we're interested here at the Giving Review, the role of the mega wealthy in, uh, in public policy, including through their, their philanthropy. Uh, so why don't we start talking about you first and how you got there, and then some of your work uh, on that issue, the role of the mega wealthy, uh, that's my characterization, not yours, in the development of uh, public policy. But uh, how'd you end up at Duke? Well, I um, had the privilege of going to Duke in the mid-90s as a Master of Public Policy student, and there I met the um, very, very well-known Professor Joel Fleischman, who has a 60-plus year career as a philanthropy scholar, as a fundraiser, um, and a, a foundation leader. Um, he, um, at that time, wanted some work done. Um, I did some work for him, and then um, several years later, uh, he was looking for a wingman or a wingwoman um, to join Duke as an assistant professor to help um, teach more courses on philanthropy and to uh, increase the level of scholarship on philanthropy. So um, I, at that point, uh, had been a founding reporter at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, where I worked for six years. Um, and then in graduate school at Harvard, I had worked with um, Bob Putnam on his very well-known book, Bowling Alone, which looked at a decline in civic engagement um, in America. And I think those those two things gave me a pretty good um, preparation for, for the job. So I was hired and I've been happily at Duke for 17 years. So are, where's home? Are you a, you're, are you from North Carolina or? or I, I am based, I, <laughs> I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, but I have commuted to my job for 17 years in Durham, North Carolina. So I'm very familiar with the um, American Airlines gate agents and pilots and so yeah. forth yeah. yeah perfect is there enough study of policy oriented philanthropy either by academics or i guess i should say or coverage by journalists uh is this studied enough or covered no enough? no and i think anything any academic would say that whatever they're studying probably needs more study so that's a given but i think it's 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 particularly true with philanthropy. So um, when the Chronicle started in 1988, um, there was very, very little coverage of philanthropy. That I think the newspaper side, the media side has gotten better over time. Um, on the scholarly side, um, I knew you were gonna ask this question and I and my impulse was to say, oh yeah, I think it's you know being studied more. And But I actually did a Google Scholar search. So this will bring up all the articles and books that talk about philanthropy. So I just looked for philanthropy and public policy, that combination of terms. and um, the, the bad news is it looks like uh, scholarship, this surprises me actually, has not really been growing in the last 15 or so years. The good news is there's still plenty done by scholars. So it, that search, simple search turned up something like 23 to 25,000 um, articles per, per year. So, um, um, or I'm sorry, per five year period. So, you know, there's still plenty being produced. It's just not... Uh, not, not enough and, and probably not enough um, really top empirical social science. Um, you know, that, that said, I want to have a caveat here. There is some good work being done in narrow, you know, in some narrow areas that are also really important. So I would say the scholarship on K through 12 education philanthropy is, is quite good and quite robust. That's an area that philanthropists have spent a lot of time on and a lot of money on and um, has attracted some scholarly attention. And, um, so you can think of the work, you know, going back to Walter Andenberg's big bed in the early 90s, up through the Gates and Broad Foundations and others today, the Walton Foundation. Um, there's also been some good work done on the Koch brothers philanthropy and related sort of policy activities and some political giving. Um, their work, of course, is to promote deregulation and market based approaches. I think there's been a fair amount written about them. Um, but the, there's so much more going on um, in the realm of philanthropy and public policy, philanthropy giving for public policy causes that nobody's looking at. So um, in 2019 alone, um, according to Candid, which used to be the Foundation Center, there are about 2,500 uh, foundations um, that, are, that were giving grants in the area of public policy narrowly construed. So that's a narrow area, right? So if you Think about it more broadly, you have many, many more thousands of foundations. Um, and those funders, those 2,500, gave about $1.1 billion to public policy causes. Now, 
that's a lot of money that could move the needle on on things. Um, but it's important to note that that's just a tiny fraction of all the money that these foundations were giving that year. Um, it was so public policy giving narrowly construed is just a little more than one percent. Um, and so the takeaway I, from this for me is that the vast majority of philanthropy is not concerned with public policy. It's kind of, you know, I'll call it apolitical. It's giving to scholarship funds and hospital wings and museums and soup kitchens and things like that. But if you look at the subset, those 2,500 funders that are doing public policy work, um, these include a lot of big foundations that are giving big dollars. So it's very skewed toward a few big funders that were that are heavily engaged in that area. So I did a quick calculation and the, the top 1% of those 2,500 funders, so the tw top 25 are giving, so 1% are giving 55% of the grant money. So it's, you know, it's very concentrated at the top. And, you know, and these are big um, brand name funders that have been around for a while, the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, Sarah, Sarah Scape on the cons more conservative side, the others are more mainstream or liberal, Robert Wood Johnson. Um, so these, these big funders, but there are some newcomers that are, I think, that are quickly gaining attention and doing interesting work. So we've got JPB as an example that's doing stuff on poverty and health equity and democracy. Um, the Arnold family, Arnold Ventures, is doing stuff on gun violence prevention, which has been an ongoing scholarly concern of mine. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot going on that's really undercovered by by reporters and understudied by scholars. Is there a, <clears throat> is it under skeptical as well? Uh, I'll just ask it that way. One might think that the journalism covering philanthropy historically maybe sort of wasn't tough enough, I guess is what I'm implying. So I might as well just put it that way. But uh, yeah. the, the coverage of or the research on these outfits, skeptical, if not cynical enough. Yeah, I mean, when the Chronicle was founded, I remember this was one of our thoughts was that philanthropy needed to be covered like every other major institution, like government, you know, with a, you know, where journalists are holding big, powerful institutions to account. That's not to say that you come into it some negative bias, but you ask critical and skeptical questions and you, you know, lay bare the operations of these institutions. So the Chronicle was founded with that mission. And, and I think, it, you know, it was right. There weren't a lot of other reporters. I think the New York Times had one reporter or something at the time. Um, you know, I would say that skepticism um, is pretty much the order of the day today, though. So um, certainly in academic circles, um, you know, academics are by nature skeptical. Um, and I would say with respect to philanthropy, those scholars who are really focusing on it are casting a pretty skeptical eye. So Rob Reich at Stanford, who's one of the leading scholars in this field, says, you know, philanthropy deserves scrutiny, not gratitude. And, you know, I think, um, you know, that's a good thing because philanthropy is, as you well know, Mike, um, you know, it consists of, you know, kind of large um, bodies of concentrated wealth. They operate with very little usually with very little transparency um, and, and little oversight from government. They don't have to respond to market signals or voters. Uh, so there's there's a lot of freedom that comes with this and, and responsibility that comes with, with philanthropy. And, and you know, I, I, I believe, and I think this is the consensus among scholars, is that, um, you know, skeptical, uh, skeptical um, studies and journalistic coverage help compensate for the lack of other accountability mechanisms that might adhere to other kinds of institutions in public life. Um, you know, but I, I, I want to be careful not to overstate that critique. Um, so the it's, there, it's very easy to stereotype philanthropists as just, you know, these out of control donors who don't care and just stomp on democracy and stomp on the everyday person and their preferences. Um, you know, in my experience as a reporter talking to philanthropists and now as a scholar doing the same, you know, I think that most of them are people of good faith. They care about their public image. They want to produce public value as they see it. Um, they're sensitive to criticism, just like the rest of us. Um, and, you know, so I, while I'm very much in support of and contribute to constructive criticism, there's a tiny part of me that worries that if we become too critical, that actually what we're going to do is um, have this perverse effect where we drive them underground, <laughs> you know, these donors and foundation people, they don't have to talk to people, they don't have to talk to the media, they don't have to tell you what they're doing. Um, and I think if we're too critical and too skeptical all the time, or we approach it from that 
perspective, we may produce the opposite of what we want, which is more information, more transparency. It's just a side concern. Um, you know, it doesn't take away from, I think, the value of having, you know, constructive criticism of any big institution um, in society, including yeah. philanthropy. How about one more quick question on the research yeah. and, and then we'll yeah. finish up with part one. Uh, how much of academic research on philanthropy is funded by philanthropy? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I, you um, know, I'm not, it's not a yeah. quiz, right? But, yeah. But to the degree that it's a lot, how much of a risk is that? This, What kind of challenge is that and how is it best to dealt with? Yeah, and that was an issue. Okay, my, my short answer is I don't know. I haven't done that study. I think it's a great question. Um, the this was a concern when um, the uh, there was a there was a fund that was set up. Um, gosh, this would have been probably it was when I was still at the Chronicle, maybe early '90s. Um, there was a fund that was set up to fund scholarly research of philanthropy, and there were people within the academy who were saying we have to worry about a conflict of interest here, and. You know, so my my research on philanthropy is funded by a a research fund that Duke University gives all professors. It's a small amount of money. Luckily, the kind of work I do doesn't take a lot of money. Um, but uh, you know, I think it, you know, I think it's a reasonable question. Scholars do generally disclose you know, where they're getting money. So if there's, you know, if there's some conflict of interest it can be judged on its own terms. Um, but but, it, but it's actually an important question because if we want more research on philanthropy, we've got to have, generally speaking, you've got to have some sources of funds. So that means either government or philanthropy. So if you, and government funding is really not going toward this at all. So it's very hard to get a National Science Foundation grant, for example, for the study of philanthropy. So the, the funding is, I don't think it's a, you know, it doesn't prevent good work from being done, but it's not, it's not overflowing either, so. Great. All right, why don't we finish up part one there and we'll pick up with part two uh, next.